Well, welcome to another um, simulcast of the Individuation podcast by the IFC and uh, the Daily Archetype with Isaac Miller, our uh, partner and friend. We welcome here today. Welcome, everybody. Today, he, uh, Isaac had an opportunity to um, get interested in Dr. Stein, Dr. Barry Stein's book, uh, Map of the Soul. Um, I know this book quite well. I've gone through it many, many times, so I know it by heart, but um, it's an excellent book uh, by Dr. Stein. Uh, it's available on Amazon if you haven't read it, if you're interested in Jungian psychology and understanding what the tenants and how to understand young in psychology. Um, this is a really good book. Uh, Isaac, um, thoughts? Oh yeah, I was just gonna mention, um, I talked a while about doing some podcasts like this, uh, probably with you mainly on definitions, like in uh, Psychological Types, Collective Works Volume 6, it goes into the definitions, which is really good, but it's a little strange only because some of them are like one line definitions and then some of them go on for pages and pages. Uh, but when I finally got into this book recently, I realized this is like exactly what people need as far as the foundation of these uh, important definitions. And uh, we recorded a podcast uh, <clears throat> Uh, recently, where we had got into some of these things, but I felt like sometimes, and this is like the issue sometimes that I get into just with talking to other people with some Jungian background as far as, you know, the, the, uh, the language where I want to have something to refer people back to. So then if we talk for a long time about complexes, for example, which is mainly what we're going to talk about today, then I can say, uh, okay, complexes are like this, but if you really want to know more about it, go, you know, I'll link to this particular episode and some other things. Uh, so yeah, I want to do like a series off and on over the next few weeks on uh, this book, Jung's Map of the Soul. And uh, I don't know if we'll go back to chapter one at some point, but I wanted to start in chapter two, just because I felt like as I was getting into this chapter last week that it's very um, foundational and important, but not talked about enough is this idea of complexes, um, especially for the things that we talk about, because we talk a lot about uh, our work that we're doing now with uh, Union Advanced Motor Processing and some other things that deal with complexes. And then just like last week when we were talking about <clears throat> uh, the self, how it can be a little bit confusing just because it's a word that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, but Jungian psychology uses it a little bit differently. Complexes are a little bit similar in that sometimes people use it differently, but not just in perhaps day-to-day -day life, but also in Freudian psychology and Adlerian well, psychology and other things. Let's, let's start with the definition so we don't sure. throw people off because yeah. if we start talking about who talks about complexes, it's a little yeah, yeah. So um, on page 52 of Jung's Map of the Soul mm -hmm. by Dr. Murray Stein, um, under the structure of complexes, uh, there's a quotation from Jung. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starts by saying, Jung describes it as being made up of associated images mm -hmm. and frozen memories of traumatic moments right. that are buried in the unconscious and not readily available for retrieval by the ego. Right. These are repressed memories, what knits the various associated elements of the complex together, holds them, knits the various associated elements of the complex together and holds them in place mm -hmm. is emotion. Right, right, right. This is the glue. Furthermore, Young says, the feeling toned mm -hmm. content and we should go back to that. Mm -hmm. The complex 
comma, consists of a nuclear element, a large number of secondarily consolidated associations. Mm -hmm. The nuclear element is the core image and experience on which the complex is based, the frozen memory. But this core turns out to be made of two parts, an image or psychic trace of the originating trauma and an innate archetypal piece closely associated to it. The dual core of the complex grows by gathering associations around itself. And this can go on over the course of an entire lifetime. Right. So I'll stop there. Right. And we'll pick this apart a little bit. This is full of um, twisting stairways. Yeah, so the yeah. The first twisting stairway <clears throat> is <clears throat> when we talk about associated images. Okay. So associated images, images throws off people because right. it's a picture. It is not right, a right, picture. Right. It's a feeling tone. It's a feeling tone, correct. It's a feeling tone means that we get a sense of what it is, but we don't really see it as right, it. right. It's not an image. Right. That's the first kind of twirling staircase that we have to deal with. Right. The other one is frozen memories of a traumatic moment. That is also an emotion. That is right. also a feeling tone emotion. Right, right. Um, the, the fragments of pictures that we have seen of the event are actually jumbled up. The emotional elements of the trauma that are split off are are easily are understood better because we have access to them that we don't have to the images. Right. Now, what this says is that these are repressed memories, what knits the various associated elements of the complex together and holds them in place is emotion. And this is what we talked about last week as the right. feeling tone. Mm -hmm. So part of when we talk about Jungian advanced motor processing and we talk about JAMP and how we conduct the treatment, right. we are talking about the complexes and how to move the emotions, the emotions that are holding these complexes together right. um, as a glue are also holding it in a way that is that um, keeps it autonomous and um, like a sub, I think he calls it like a sub personality. Yeah. Partial personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And which is something I don't, yeah, he did mention a little bit in this chapter later on how, uh, which is something we talked about a little bit uh, last time where they take on a life of their own, they become autonomous and uh, that's just the nature of it. So it's not like something you can, there can be any other way to it. It's something you have to play to that nature of these things have a life of their own. And the other thing that uh, wasn't talked about there, but I think he talks about later in the chapter is how, and, and we talked about it last time, how they're like double agents. They will have this life of their own, but they will deny it. They'll try to be like, oh no, it's just me, uh, John Smith or whoever. They will try to act like they are the actual personality usually. Uh, and so then when a complex comes in and sort of that, so this is like what we talked about a little bit in some of our previous podcasts, how uh, something will align that free feeling tone. It could be uh, some memory or some situation that puts on that same feeling tone, which is often related to your ego development and even shadow development and other parts of the, the person's actual personality. And to simplify it, he talks mm -hmm. about buttons. He says, we have right, right. A, what you're talking about is basically certain buttons or what right. I call triggers. Mm -hmm that we have set up. And these triggers, mm. um, as you are saying very clearly, right. are part of how we developed, how we saw the world, how we came out in the world, and how the world reacted to us. Right. So that becomes um, the trigger 
Mm-hmm. And what happens, I think, is the next part is that the um, complex mm-hmm. is activated, right? right. He says there's, uh, there's two pieces to the core. Mm-hmm. Um, of a complex. I think that one is definitely the archetypal structure of the core. But since it is an archetype. Well, it is. It falls it, it, in an instinct. Yeah, well, it's it is, but... I, and I think this goes again into some of the things we're talking about last time or one of the last times was um, there's like a normal healthy flow of the archetypal structure, which is sort of like the map. But then a lot of times these additional uh, structures go on top of it. And you right. know, sometimes we talk about these like they're the, the monsters that can box us in into our little area on the map, or they can help, they can make us feel trapped and they can, and the ego might think that it's protecting itself from uh, pain, which might be maturation or conscious development. Uh, so it can kind of like, uh, it, it can be like a uh, ad, ad, what's a tricky word, abnormality to the archetype. So if the archetype is flowing perfectly and healthfully, then you could say that complex that um, archetypes and all these different things are in themselves complexes. But on top of those, in, in certain areas where you have certain specific feeling tones, there gets to be additional uh, specific complexes to each individual and their unique story and unique life that gets built up and, and put on top of the uh, normal archetypal structure in a person. And what we talk about in JAMP or Young and Advanced Motor Processing is yep. when you arrive at the complex, what you find is a field filled with landmines. And these landmines are emotions. And these emotions are sitting there waiting to be activated, waiting to be triggered. This is what Stein is talking about in terms of the glue that holds the emotions together. Right. And what we do with uh, young and advanced motor processing is we actually hook the emotion, uh, the, um, these emotions, these glue, Mm. we hook them into um, pulling them away, stripping them from the core of the complex and that's what we work on Mm -hmm. we don't work on changing the complex the complex is archetypal it sits on an archetypal center you cannot mess with that it has evolved as as he goes on to Mm -hmm. say in the chapter very clearly that young believe that in families um that different people boys and girls uh uh, will inherit different complexes from um, the same gender parent, I think is the, uh, what he was talking about. Um, I would go and say, okay, yes, uh, these are social complexes that are uh, part of the collective, but also that we have these collective complexes that uh, have been inherited because of not just gender, but because of the family that lives there. So if you were a Jewish family, or if you were a persecuted family, or if you were a Muslim family, um, these, um, these complexes are also inherited because of um, the way your people have been treated um, during long periods of time and history or living in certain places. Well, and not, that gets not very accommodating to uh, your own structure of societal. That gets into another tricky ball of wax, which is that so, some of the main complexes or a couple of the main complexes are actually archetypes that mm-hmm. become complex or complexes are the the mother and father archetype and complex. So the mother and father archetypes should be uh, very um, healthy and flow from the individual psyche to the family psyche to the sort of uh, folk or village psyche to the world. 
and it should have a really good flow of those uh, authority, uh, masculine, feminine energies. However, what happens to uh, pretty much everyone is, especially because it's unconscious, as that they develop, those become not just that innate flow of masculine, feminine, authoritative uh, psychic energy, but they become complex, especially as that it relates to first themselves and then their parents and then uh, those who are similar to their parents and those who have those authoritative roles. And so uh, early in life, even from being one, two, three, four years old, you, a person starts to develop those mother father complexes and those complexes get more and more complex over time. And then that's why even in our present day, we have these issues where it's like a person that's even an adult or 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old will have like mommy issues, daddy issues and everything else. It's not just about their mom and dad and how much that they paid attention to them. It is that. And that's sort of like the probably root of it for the most part, but then it expands out onto all masculinity, femininity and society in general and well, also let's, internal let's slow conflicts. It down. Let's slow it down because yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really expansive view, which is... Yeah what we should get into but let's look at it on an individual level so sure sure my father never had a mother his mm. mother died in childbirth he was mm. raised by a blind grandmother so wow. when he says to me that he was an orphan mm. um that rings true and that mm. he said not that long ago during this crisis the um, COVID crisis, COVID and conflict. Yep. But anyway, um, what he said was, it's lonely being in the world without mm. a mother. So what he was saying was, is that he recognizes that everybody needs a mother. He understands right. not having a mother. And just because of her absence, right. he develops the complex. All right, right, right. Not like, I do. I develop a complex because my mother was well and she took care of me and we were right. very close and I loved her and right. her loss was very traumatic for me. And mm. So the way I have a mother complex and the way my father has his mother complex are completely different. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a good example. Okay. So what you're talking about is that there is an individual level to the complex which is right. everybody has what is called a mother. Right. Okay. Even if they so never knew their mother or never knew their father. Doesn't, doesn't matter. That's the archetype. The right, archetype right. is that there is a mother and there is a father to all of us. Or there is a cell. We come from certain cells that um, are carried in both the feminine and the masculine. Right. Or if we go back into, you know, so these are all kind of the, the footsteps. But when we get into the complexes, mm -hmm. we have to differentiate between the personal and the collective. Right, right, right. Personal right. complex. So let's talk about Germany. Von Franz talks about the Germans and right. um, their father complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How their father complex is warlike mm -hmm. and pushes them when there's um, way too much patriotism mm -hmm. or that kind of fever, that emotional tone complex has been activated in the collective. Mm -hmm. Right. That people, that this becomes an overpowering complex. Right. When that complex, according to Von Franz, and I am paraphrasing her at best, mm -hmm. what um, happens is, is that the Germans are defeated. And because they're defeated in World One, yeah, uh, this inflames the complex. Now right. the complex is consolidated, as what Stein <coughs> talks about, as becoming a um, a the complex becomes consolidated and therefore mm -hmm. it supersedes the conscious ego. Right, right, right. And when it supersedes the conscious ego, then it acts as a, a its own center or its own personality mm -hmm. and thus it has its own beliefs it has its own way of being in the world 
and has a way of understanding and negotiating in the world. Yeah, it has its own strengths and its own uh, vulnerabilities. And it's, it's interesting that you mention the Germans, as von Franz did, between World War I and World War II as they uh, developed their third right position and all of that. And that's something that um, Carl Jung talked about a few times is how, how that he could see that sort of swelling up in the unconscious, especially of his German patients, him being in Switzerland, he dealt with a lot of uh, German patients and talking about their dreams. Uh, he would see these father complexes and uh, hero complexes starting to develop. And then, so then what happened was basically someone just had to fill that role, which is what, you know, Hitler became. He just stepped into that role. If, if the. But if you go back just a little bit, if you go yeah. back, you're talking about the, um, the hero complex and the mm -hmm. father complex. Yeah. Now what you're looking at is there's a collective element to this. Yeah. As soon as the hero is introduced, there's a collective element to it. Right. And if it's tied into the father, then there's a collective element of how to prove how to be a hero is, is told by the father. The father says, right. so who is the natural father um, for the Germans? And who is this person? And he, this father um, is a father of war, a father yeah. of destruction, a father mm -hmm. of domination. Yeah, and over, over emphasis on structure and cleanliness and purity and all these things that like a father should be, but of course that was to the extreme but that's like what their consciousness was hungry for at that time because of their well, it's not the complex. father it's not the father but it is the emotion it's the emotion emotional tone of the complex right 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 that creates the need for purity for cleanliness for these ideals that are really um, um, what's the word for it uh, their concepts, they're not ideals to live by. They're concepts that people talk about. Yeah. Being clean or being logical or being sufficient or well, taking what care it, of oneself. What it is is that they are um, like in the masculine authority as that. And then uh, the feminine authority can sometimes be similar in its uh, protectiveness, but that they are uh, necessary within balance. Uh, but then what happens is they felt out of balance in this example of the Germans that uh, Jung and von Franz talked about. And so then that need was filled, which is how uh, religious organizations spring up as a need for uh, a father and or mother complex and these nationalistic organizations spring up, including uh, the Third Reich, including uh, that of Stalin and Mao and, and many others. They, they need either a masculine authority or a feminine authority. And all this, again, is to get into the complex of the, the mother or father, which starts on the individual. And then if it's in a major uh, area, like a nation like these, then it it's sort of a uh, collectivizes itself and then it can then be projected upon an individual which will happen often in, in these uh leaders where uh a, a nation will will go a certain way like that so so i think so the like we're using the germans as an example because yeah. of uh, because of young's connection to them right as well as von franz and von franz and they talk about um all of these gods right right, right. so so part of the thing that we re need to remember of what happens to us is that we 
have evolved through millennia. Right. And these defenses, um, these archetypes, these archetypal, um, what they talk about as images or feeling right. tones that exist within us um, that attract the energy mm. of the complex, the energy of the complex of the father, the complex of the mother, the complex of the hero, the right. complex of um, the unwanted, the complex of the orphan, and so on and so forth. There's many, many complexes we could go on forever to talk about. Right. So I think that in terms of the complex, mm. the complex exists mm. as, as Stein puts it, the complex also exists to help us um, strengthen the ego. So the right. more that the complexes are activated, the more energy the ego requires to become conscious and to become stronger. Mm -hmm. So that push pull in between the complexes and the ego, the ego we refer to in Jungian psychology that just for those who don't know it very well, the ego is also a complex. So it's competing against other pieces of psyche that resemble it, but are not it. Because the ego is main base is mainly based in the conscious mind yeah so it's not based in the unconscious mind what is this, based in the unconscious mind is what the youngians call shadow right but the ego competes against the complexes yeah so this go on this is a uh something that stein started out the chapter with on the, on the first page of chapter two he said young felt uh that these collisions between psyche and world have a positive function if not too harsh they tend to simulate ego development because they demand greater focusing cap capacity on the part of consciousness and uh, eventually this leads to a stronger problem solving ability and greater individual autonomy so what happens is the ego is this center of consciousness and it goes up against other things it, he he says the world but basically it goes up against anything whether it's an internal uh conflict or a thing well, in, it's in the, the world conscious part of your world at least right. at the beginning yeah, yeah i think what he means is that the ego is the conscious part of your world it's the mm. it's the flashlight that you uh you light up from your side that shows that you're aware Mm. of this side of you right so that goes that basically goes into a ring with a lot of pieces that are not of the conscious world mm. of the unconscious world and it fights them for as much control as possible as it grows as we know this from psychology mm. as um, the ego grows so does the shadow so the more consciousness the ego um, arrives at the more the unconscious um, is also arriving at those. Yeah, same thing with the persona, which is a in a later chapter. As it, uh, and we can't really get into it today. We'll do that another day. But basically, as the the persona is the mask that we put on towards the outside world, but we're also usually uh, fooling ourselves with it, and that also strengthens the shadow and. Uh, it's good to mention that though because so the persona is both conscious mm -hmm. and unconscious right right unlike the ego which is but is conscious unlike right. the shadow which is unconscious right, right the persona can have two sides to it right it can be both i want to look like um um the god of war or i want to look like a mermaid or i want to there are two sides of it one side right. is that conscious side that I want to dress up as the God of war. And then there's this unconscious side of uh, being the God of war is to connect to the archetype. Mm -hmm. So it's both I am one and I am several. Mm -hmm. We are not what we think we are because we are always trying to integrate pieces of us that 
we didn't know existed. And part of the individuation process and part of what we do with uh, young and advanced motor processing is yeah. to integrate the pieces that are not integrated, that are yeah. disassociated. Which uh, we mention all that because what makes all these things so slippery and tricky is that they are usually put in these positions as we develop into uh, fully autonomous adult conscious individuals uh, by the by the complexes, especially as you know, that, which another another reason this is important is because sometimes like when we did that uh, conference a couple months ago, it was focused on the shadow and. You know, sometimes I'll talk about the shadow and we'll, we'll talk about shadow in these Carl Jung groups and everything else, but it's, it's somewhat impossible to deal with the shadow without dealing with the complexes because well, the, the shadow is a complex. I mean, that's yeah. the easiest. So we refer to it as shadow and then we mm. think we separate it from complex. It's not shadow is a complex shadow is a defense mechanism. Right. Shadow rises within the unconscious because the ego is trying to dictate um, dictate a one-sided view of the world. Yeah, so so the maybe, shadow takes the other side of the world and says, well, I have a different point of view. So maybe a way to uh, uh, neatly put these together, if possible, is to say there are collective slash universal complexes, which would include these that we talk about, shadow, persona, our complexes, including uh, mother, both father. Personal and collective. All these right. complexes are both, the complex is always part of the personal development of the individual, then connected mm. to the social fabric of right, development right. within the society. Right. And then you have the collective aspect of where this person uh, originated from. I mean, think about mm -hmm. the genetic testing they do, Isaac, and think about how many ways and how many different um, type of people you come from. Right. Right. And how that has all been formed. Now, mm. so even our DNA, right, that is passed from uh, one person to the other. There are structures to DNA. Complexes have structures, and these structures are the parts that define who we are as human beings and how much we've evolved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess what I'm getting at, though, is how, like what we do in therapy and even a, this developing therapy, you can advance motor processing, is we'll try to because it's hard to t tell a person like, let's just talk about your shadow. Let's talk about your persona or your mother complex or whatever. Uh, you could probably get into a little bit of detail on that. That's where, you know, it most personally attaches you know, one of these universals is onto the mother or father complex. And you might even get into sibling complexes, but uh, uh, so, so we want to find the most personal complexes as we try to, you know, promote healing. And so that's how that in therapy. And that's the trauma, that's right. the emotions of the trauma that right. are tied in along the edges. Those are tied into the personal complexes you're talking about. Right. So that's why in therapy and this developing therapy of Jungian advanced motor processing, uh, you'll try to focus on the traumas because that's how we can find the more personal complexes and uh, you know, th those are like the monsters that we talk about. And then we can, you know, we don't necessarily have to slay the monster, but we can maybe tame the monster or just get you get the individual to realize the monster isn't that monstrous. Uh, you know, in other words, if you have this feeling tone related to uh, cars or elevators or you know these kind of things like sometimes people get from a car accident or a claustrophobic person or an agoraphobic person you slowly get them to overcome that by talking about the trauma and the uh that feeling tone and then through these types of therapy you can overcome that complex with that individual so 
in in the context that you're talking about mm. advanced motor processing yeah here's a dream from one of the people that i've been treating for a while okay um we call her grace She's sure been very um um amazing about sharing um this with us yeah so it says that this is one of her dreams now she's been doing uh young advanced motor processing i've been doing it with her uh the treatment for about um a little maybe around 10 sessions so far okay so this dream is of course she has like six dreams a week that wow. she numbers to, and she writes down uh -huh. But this is what happens with the Jungian advanced motor processing. It activates your symbolic world, your dream world. It just completely unfolds it. So she writes, right. I, was a, I was in a city near a seawall. Hmm. It was twilight. Uh -huh. I was in a courtyard type area, all rock concrete, and I was nude. Uh -huh. A surge of seawater came over the wall. Mm -hmm. The courtyard was surrounded by a short wall about 2.5 feet tall. The surge of water filled the courtyard. I laid back in the water and floated on my back with my hair streaming around my head. I was not cold nor uncomfortable in any way. It was very pleasant. I allowed the currents of the water to move around me. The water receded. I was on my feet still nude. A pudgy white man approached me, lecherously trying to touch me. Every time he reached out, I pushed his hand away and said, no, that's a feeling tone. Yeah. The lecherous man in this dream is a feeling tone. Trying because she is, on, she is A, dreaming. Yeah. So the pieces of her dream are pieces of her, not right. of anybody else. In the dream, these are pieces of her. Her now, psyche. Also be parts of the collective well but the, the, the collective how they attach in her consciousness exactly so um every time he reached out i pushed his hand away and said no mm -hmm. okay so she's reaching out and she's saying no at the same time so mm -hmm. there's a conflict there's an internal conflict mm -hmm. behind which i reach out and i say no yeah i want to reach out but i say no I was stepping backward away from him, but did not feel afraid nor intimidated in any way. Hmm. I was up against the wall, the furthest from the seawall, and he moved toward me. Wow. I fell backward, sitting on the wall. He moved over me in a threatening manner. I leaned back and brought up my right leg and kicked him as hard as I could with the flat of my foot in the balls. He backed up, <laughs> doubled over in pain. I walked up to him and squatted down to his level and looked him in the eye and, and said, quote, I said no, firmly and loudly. Now, in this uh, dream, what, what Grace is fighting with, uh -huh. this lecherous, um, pudgy, guy. pudgy, white, male, uh -huh. who she told no to is a complex. Yeah. All right. And I think uh, that uh, Stein talks about this. This is an interesting part uh -huh. where he quotes Young and says that Young uh -huh. talks about different figures in the dream as complexes. All right. And as complexes, they come to, um, you know, talk to us. All right. And so because we talked about this earlier, what happens is... Uh -huh. When we do the treatment mm -hmm. of the Jungian advanced motor processing, we have opened the path, the door, the bridge, the tunnel between the conscious and the unconscious. Right. And now she's able to negotiate, talk to, and not be terrified of the complexes. Right, right, right. In the past, and past dreams mm. that I will share uh, with mm. our listeners right. in the uh, next the next couple of podcasts. Sure. Um, what she had in her past dreams and how mm. these figures would dominate. Right, right, right. And not necessarily be uh, 
be more at your level that you could push back against. Mm -hmm. So what we talk about in the dream is that her dream ego, mm -hmm. it's not her in the dream. It's not her physically, it's her dream ego. Right. It's a piece of her that she sees in the dream and she says, this part is me. Sure. Yeah. That's me. Now, yeah. now it doesn't have to be your physical self. It could right. be anything. Right. It could be a dog. It could be a tree. <laughs> It could, could be a tree, it could, could be, be a anything. house. Yeah. So what she identifies as her is floating in between the conscious and the unconscious. She floats mm. on water. Water is the symbol of the unconscious. Yeah. Floating is regaining a form of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning of the dream, if we can recall, it says I was in a city near a seawall. I was in a city. I am the city and surrounded by the sea. Right. So and it's for my seawall is basically my ego. Well, it's like uh, the city is a, you know, it's, it's like uh, Alan Watts always talks about how in a city it's full of all these squares and rectangles, which only comes about through consciousness. So it's basically all these constructed uh, complexes in, in a city. Uh, and so a city kind of represents these conscious structures that are in our normal consciousness. And then being next to the sea with a seawall is there's like that division between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. But yes, then but see it that clearly is what we're talking about. Yeah. So then when it, young in advanced motor processing mm, is it integrates the, the both become more and more clear in regard right, right. To what is what is coming to me, what I am understanding, and what yeah. is not coming to me, and what I am not understanding. Right, right. So uh, the still the menacing figure mm -hmm. is this lecherous, white, pudgy man. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, that's the part she's not conscious of yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The part she's saying no to is the part she's not conscious of. She needs to become more conscious of that part of her she's afraid of. Right, right. Because remember, this is a dream. Yeah, because all I got, I, I post, it was almost like a Jungian uh, Cohen, <laughs> but I, I posted a thing a couple days ago where I said, like, all conflict is self conflict. And it on the individual level, but also in that there's the collective love, self. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the collective self as well. So, what she's dealing with there is if she can overcome whatever that thing is, and she's starting to, because in her previous dream, she was um, terrified by this individual, and now she's standing up to him, kicking him in the balls and telling him no. Well, she's uh, also, at the beginning here, uh, she's also floating. I was not cold nor uncomfortable in any way. It was very pleasant. I allowed the currents of the water to move me around. Yeah, so everything's going great until the, this other complex shows up. Yes. Mm. So basically, there's a standoff between two parts of her. Right. One that sees her as free. Right, right, right. And that can, like, fly. Mm -hmm. And the other sees her as something that can be dominated and hurt. Or that she is forced to to dominate the other thing. That she, she has to get in that position where she must. Well, in the past, she mm. would have basically given in and felt shamed. Yeah, yeah. But in the present, she does not feel shamed by the complex. She feels empowered to stand up to it. Right, right, right. But yet, <laughs> you still have to go to the next level. The right, next right. level is identifying the complex. Mm -hmm. What is that part of me mm -hmm. that terrorizes me and makes me feel uncomfortable and makes me feel unsafe and right, makes right. me want to say no? What part is that? Right, right. And uh, the, the, what's great about uh, bringing up this particular dream is that uh, right before you did, we, we were talking about how uh, this is a really good example of uh, there are these collective slash universal complexes like the ones that we've talked about, which would include 
the conscious mind, the unconscious mind, and shadow, persona, ego, all these things. But then there are the individual ones. So it's relatively easy to talk to a person and be like, look, this is your maybe shadow. This is your, in your conscious mind. This is your unconscious mind and how they come together. But what can get tricky is figuring out those individual personal complexes that come from unique traumas to that person's story. But as the person figure those, figures those out is how that they find you know, long-term uh, healing and power and everything else. And that's what these uh, union treatments are all about. And healing the complex. So let's think about before okay. you, before sure. you finish that thought, because sure. I want you to like comment on this also, but sure. let's take Batman. So okay. Batman has the trauma, has the complex. Yeah. Right. He carries the complex, the death he's, of the father and mother orphan. that he saved. He's an orphan. Um, he needs revenge. He needs to somehow fix what was broken, mm -hmm. to reclaim power that was lost. Mm -hmm. um, he dresses up to keep his identity from others, but he's really becoming this other thing when he dresses up. is no longer, he becomes this creature. He becomes the bat. He becomes the archetype. Right, right, right. of um, the night he becomes the right. archetype of the shadows and he mm -hmm. identifies with and the other part of him is selfish uh childish um spoiled uh, yeah playboy fri fri frivolous um nonchalant mm -hmm. so um, the way they treat those. So when you're talking about that is easy to see how we talk about the shadow and the persona and these, what you're talking about is like Batman. We can yeah. talk about these aspects of the pieces of the person, but we're not really talking about the core of the person and how the complex, he's right. basically been consolidated by the complex. The complex has taken over. All right, all right. Right. So the complex of the savior has taken over. And now whatever he does, he can't stop it. Right. It comes back to him. Right. 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 right? And I think that's part of where Stein talks about mm -hmm. uh, when the complex becomes consolidated and we are basically being held hostage. Yeah. It, it takes on a form of position pushed out of the way. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, to Stein's point, how he gives the example of uh, buttons, or, or we might say triggers today, but, the, and that's, again, to like, put it at all these levels, uh, you can always see this when you have a intimate couple or, you know, romantic partners that are having their uh, toxic uh, feuds, you know, the, what's always happening is they're pushing each other's complexes slash buttons they have learned what each other's buttons are and so their uh ploy f to gain power over each other or feel empowered over the other is to push each other's buttons and so that's how you see uh, yes or they have they have inadvertently pushed each other's triggers yeah sometimes it's and, unconscious and it just and it just is like a volcano yeah uh, the eruption starts and as the pressure builds more and more of the lava is going to flow. Yeah. Well, because what usually happens in those is it's because the relation, like that won't happen. Like even if, if you meet a stranger on the street, they might be able to push a button here or there, or, you know, sometimes you can get, get a button pushed by somebody cutting you off in traffic and you know, that makes you feel a certain way and that might push a button. But the ones who can really push your buttons are the ones who have uh, push the happy buttons in the past. <laughs> so that's what usually happen with a, you know, a romantic, intimate partner couple is for a while, they're pushing their happy buttons and everything's like love and happiness and joy. But then once that maxes out, it goes down the hill the other way and they still want to maintain this power and control and everything else. So then they start trying to dominate each other through pushing each other's uh, angry complex uh, sad buttons, what we'll say, mm. uh, which is something that uh, Stein talks about in that chapter uh, is pushing each other's buttons. And um, 
so it, it manifests in these levels. We have the individual level. And like we talked about when we did our podcast last time, how we need others to reflect on and project on so we can see what's inside. Correct. And if we don't have that, the only clue primarily is, is going to be our dreams. Uh, so these are the ways that we can see what's inside because we just have this like tiny little vantage point of ego consciousness and uh, the ego consciousness tries to block itself in and protect itself and also to um, give itself its, its image of what it is, which is oftentimes uh, a false one or an, or an illusion. And so if we figure but that, out but, uh, that, uh, that resistance is needed to yeah. promote more and more consciousness, the more yeah. the irritation, the more, the bigger, the fight, the more consciousness mm -hmm. is involved, mm -hmm. the bigger, the, the biggest problem is when the complex is consolidated. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to have consciousness because the ego has been sidelined. Mm. So then the ego has to come back and say, what the hell happened? I have to figure this out. Right. How, di how did I break down? How did I lose control? Right. It's not you who lost control. It's not you who broke down. It's that the ego, the complex of the ego is that which fall fell apart. Yeah. And I think that Stein um, has this very, um, stubborn point about mm. how strong the ego can become and how it can uh, hold itself together in the realm of consciousness. As much as I agree to that, mm -hmm. I still think that the more tenuous its hold on reality is, or the more tenacious actually, not tenuous, mm. the more tenacious its hold on reality, the more it's at war with different parts of its uh, of the psyche, right? And that uh, that causes a huge eruption. And I think he kind of mentions that as we, uh, the chapter moves along. And since we're only covering chapter two, these are aspects of what we're going to talk about in chapter two. And I didn't want to get yeah. into other chapters because then we lose our listeners. Yeah, the way, they all connect though. We want to show you. This is the cover of the book. It's yeah. called Young's Map of the Soul. Yeah. And, and uh, this is the back. And you yeah, can get I'll, it on I'll, Amazon. This is uh, Dr. Murray Stein. I'll put it in the links too. So we'll put that in the link for you so you can follow this conversation if you want to follow it through the book and see what Stein is saying and what we're saying about what Stein is saying uh, regarding Young. So everybody's talking about something that Carl Jung said uh, through different interpretations of what he said. But this is a really good interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Carl Jung, that's why we're using it. That's why we're... Um, what, one, one thing I like about this book, and I, again, the reason why I wanted to uh, get into it a bit today is um, because people often ask me, like, if I'm new to, you know, Jungian psychology, or I'm curious about it, and... I want to learn more about it. Where do I start? Because, you know, uh, Carl Jung's books are like 20 something volumes and plus some other books and it's, it's an infinite thing to get into. Yeah. Uh, and this one and the other one, uh, I don't have it right here. I've got it somewhere. Around. But the, the other one is the, the practical Jung. Yeah. And uh the practical yes. young is the ABCs. This is a little bit more. Um, this is a little bit more of a midway book. Um, but practical young. Uh, I think I have the practical one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah. Um, so the the are still available on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, so those are good uh, foundational points especially because if you just start getting into because where a lot of people like to start just because it's talked about a lot and quoted a lot is they'll start with uh volume nine and get into you know archetypes and the collective unconscious and even ion and this is i think why a lot of times people are like oh carl jung is just uh they'll say negative things or like he's just a mystic because they don't understand it but it's because they they start in the wrong place uh 
you know, and, and if people want to start with Hume too, I, I would definitely wouldn't start there. Maybe volume six, seven, or eight, but definitely not nine because nine, by that point, you've got to get those foundational things from. Well, so I think one of the things about Young is that he talked about so many different things. Yeah, and it all and ties so together. Many things in depth and so many other things kind of like uh, waved his magic wand, uh, yeah. wand around and had other people kind of get into the depths of those things. And I think right. that's where people get confused because he's such a brilliant mind and he was able to um, stretch himself uh, intellectually and um, historically to include so many different studies from so many different um, people and places uh -huh. to make a working, this is a living psychology. This is right. something that Young said it and therefore this is fact. Young right, said right. it and he opened the doorway and many of the Jungians have followed through that door and found other pathways in. Like the Jungian advanced motor processing, mm. we have found a more modern path into what Jung talked about in terms of the complexes, what, how, what he talked about in terms of individuation, what he talked mm. about in terms of understanding and knowing the self. Mm. Yeah, and... Um... Thanks. Uh, but the, the reason I mentioned that is just because uh, this book, Jung's Map of the Soul, was published first in 1998, and it had a bunch of uh, reprints as late as at least uh, 2010. So, you know, sometimes I'll, if I'm reading either Carl Jung or uh, some of those who came right after him, like von franz or eric neumann who are some of the ones i recommend too right away uh they'll be really good but they're speaking back in the 50s and 60s and you know that era for the most part but with uh marie stein who, who you worked with a bit when he was in chicago uh for years i guess uh he is updated and he's in america at that time and so when he can speak of these things, he's he's understood the the Jungian approach, but he's applying it to twentieth uh, or twenty first century life for the most part. Well, so, this is also the inspiration for uh, BTS, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the this Korean K-pop group. Yeah, the the K-pop group uh, from South Korea. Yeah. They uh, they have been inspired by the writings and uh, they sing about the writings of the uh, Jungian map of the soul. There is um, there's a collective voice here that um, Dr. Stein um, puts out in the world um, when he is talking about Jung mm -hmm. and how Jung saw the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's... Um, I think it's for our time. I think these right. are these are the stories we need to read now and understand of where we're going and where we're headed as technology keeps moving forward and as we um, we are moving forward, but not as fast as technology is moving. So we have tendencies to forget that we're still animals that are trying to find our way in the world right, right, right. there's still organisms that are evolving all right um yeah so this is a lot and uh, so much to get to i think maybe we will do maybe a shorter one yeah um, well that's uh i think that yeah. uh, this is a good start yeah. Isaac, and we should like pick up more chapters out of this book to right. discuss for our listeners yeah um, I would also uh, like to let them know that um, we are continuing to explore young and advanced motor processing through these lectures and yeah. talk about how it fits in the young and realm of treatment for trauma, for anxiety, for disassociation, right. um, and several other issues for pain, 
um, for um, complexes, how this works and how we're gonna explore it is by using um, different Jungians to think about and explore what Jung defined in terms of what psychological makeup and how does it look like, what we look like, what uh, Stein talks about as the interior of um, the map. The right. interior map is that of what Stein calls the soul. That's the interior map. And that's right. what we're drawing out, me and Isaac. Mm. Um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I would like to thank the Daily Archetype as our partner and um, as our, these podcasts that will continue um, to be aired on both the Daily Archetype and the Institute for Conflicts Individuation podcast. I am Dr. Lahab El Samurai. I want to thank everyone for a great year on the podcast. Yeah. Um, we've had a very successful year on the podcast. We've had listeners from 37 different countries. We have had um, 1611 listens during the year, uh, which for the first year of this endeavor has been excellent. Uh, we're hoping for um, Corona and conflict to end with vaccine and we can move forward from that in the time of Corona and conflict. Isaac, what would you like to um, yeah, I would just say that the, the only other thing I wanted to mention is this term identification, which has to do with how um, we absorb attitudes and objects and everything else to uh, develop the ego. And the reason that's important is because as that we, we can become maladapted and that is a lot of what's happening in this year is our uh, things that we had identified with, whether that is our groups that we could normally get together with or uh, what we thought was going on in the world uh, politically or with the media or anything else, we're all having trouble figuring out how and what and why to identify with what. So in general, our uh, consciousness is under a lot of strain and uh, I also mentioned that because we probably will do at least a short one at some point on uh, chapter one. And then we'll, we'll visit this off and on over the next few months and probably get through the nine chapters of this book, uh, Jung's Map of the Soul by Murray Stein. And yeah, this has been good. And so I look forward to doing more of these and not just on this subject, but some others that we'll be doing off and on. And thank you very much, Dr. Lahav Al Samurai. Thank and you, Isaac. And I hope that um, um, that everybody is well. Yeah. And everybody <clears throat> is staying safe. And we will talk to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for joining us today for another podcast. All right. Thank you, everyone.